Okay, great. Um, I'll make a start. So welcome everyone to this IES webinar, Time Will Say Nothing But I Told You So, Uncertainty in EIA. Today we're delighted Hi, everyone. to be joined by just Sue joining, Chadwick, I'm just going to give a, a planning couple of minutes to an academic with on. professional experience in the public and private sector and a PhD in planning law. Today's webinar will provide an exploration of the concept of uncertainty and how it's addressed in the Environmental Impact Assessment or EIA process. As always with our webinars, there will be a Thanks chance for joining for today, everyone. I'm just going to give it a minute or so, so please do submit joins. these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation, and I will then ask these on your behalf later on during the Q&A session. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for logging in and joining us today, and a special thank you to Sue for presenting. Over to you now, Sue. Thank you. Thanks, Ethne. And hello to everyone who's um, turned up today. Um, as Ethne says, my background is as a planning solicitor, but I'm also an academic and I've been particularly Thanks for interested joining everyone. For a I'll just get started very shortly, just waiting for everyone to filter the on. Emerging new technologies will change and influence our um, planning processes. This is where the um, slides that worked so well in the practice session have now decided not to work. I am so sorry about this, everyone. There we are. Okay. And I'm looking at core issues really here, because as any of you know, when you are dealing with a proposal that involves some kind of public consent, whether that's an EIA, an SEA for a plan, or the new environmental outcomes reports under the new Act, you as professionals have to assess the likely environmental impact of the proposals and then a public body will make a decision about them. And those assessments are increasingly being not supplanted but helped by AI and technological developments. Um, there's an enormous amount of exciting work going on all over the place, but I've got particular connections with the Alan Turing Institute, and I'm always astonished by the projects that are going on there, and I've given a link to a, just some of them, the ones that I thought were particularly exciting. But what that doesn't change is when you are making a decision about something that's going to happen, you have to deal with uncertainty. And that's the same for the humans as well as the AI. And I think there's a bit of a tendency to think that if you're using analytical methods, you can eliminate uncertainty. And that is definitely not the case. It adds a different kind of uncertainty all of its own. And so what I'm doing today is mostly focusing on how the courts deal with uncertainty. So a situation where an environmental prediction is made, a local authority or a secretary of state makes a decision to go ahead on something, and then that is challenged in the courts. And what the courts do when they are faced with two often different assessments of what an environmental impact will be and how they address those conflicts but at the end, I'm also going to have a small section on algorithmic uncertainty, digital uncertainty, where I'm much less specialised. But I think we do need to be aware of that as we move into the technological age and as climate change becomes increasingly central to the development agenda. So I'll be looking at how courts have dealt with legal uncertainty till now, particularly in regards to scientific evidence, how statistical uncertainty is different, and then some suggestions for how we can make good decisions while still being uncertain. So I'm going to try and be as light touch as possible with the law today um, because it's quite a complex area. And I think it's quite helpful to know that underneath any public decision, there is hundreds of years sometimes of case law going back behind that. And that doesn't, doesn't really matter whether it's a Secretary of State approving the route of a new um, solar farm or a local authority um, approving um, the location of a new shopping centre or even 
um, a local authority approving a new medical facility or a new way of doing something that isn't anything to do with development planning. Whatever, whenever a public authority makes a decision, it has a duty of fairness, a duty to carry out what they call sufficient inquiry, so ask the right questions and to take reasonable account of the answer, and a duty to have regard to what is relevant to that decision. And those things are established in case law over the years. In addition, we've got two very important statutes. We've got the Human Rights Act, we've got the Equality Act, and both of those also insert principles like not interfering with um, the, uh, the human right to enjoy land or the Equality Act duty not to discriminate against certain categories of the population. Um, and then in addition to that, for a specific decision, there might be, for example, a, a particular statute that says when you're making decisions under this statute, um, say the Planning Act 2008 for a development consent order, then you've also got to do certain consultations with certain people. And that underlies all public sector decisions. And then you've got environmental decisions. So if you're take, making um, a decision that has an EIA, then a local authority has to come to a reasoned conclusion on the significance. If you're doing a strategic environmental assessment for a plan, that local authority can't adopt the plan until account has been taken of the likely environmental impacts. As we increasingly replace EIA with EOR under the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill, again, you still have to think about environmental impacts and they must be taken into account before a consent can be given. And in each case, Humans have to make a judgment, and the humans making that judgment are often not specialists, based on formal predic predication of environmental impacts from environmental specialists and the possible mitigations for those environmental impacts. And increasingly, that decision is informed by scientific evidence. Um, species, marine species affected by an underwater facility, um, flora and fauna are affected by um, redevelopment of a site on chalklands, um, air impacts, wind impacts, increasingly important with climate change flooding impacts. And then, as well as the group of humans making the decision, you almost always have another group of humans, at least one other group of humans, who are not happy with the principle that's being proposed. And when those, when that group of humans has the resources to challenge the decision, the whole thing gets put in front of a judge in the high court, usually to start off with. And I think there's a tendency at that point to think, well, the judges will say who was right and who was wrong when it came to assessing the scientific judgment. And that's not how the courts look at uncertainty. Because what the courts will do is say, was this judgment properly made according to those public law principles that I looked at in that previous slide? So there was this case of Richards and the Environmental um, Commission where it was a, a really awful um, waste disposal site where they hadn't managed hydrogen sulfide emissions properly and there was a boy with asthma who was particularly affected and the judge said you know this is a really moving case but I am only looking at how the regulator dealt with its licensing function he wasn't going to look at the, the more um, publicly concerning aspects of it similarly this is the case this year um, where the Secretary of State issued a consent for three road schemes and a climate change was raised as it increasingly is as a basis for the challenge. And he said what the courts are increasingly saying, it is not for the courts to be drawn into the arena of the merits of climate decision making. <clears throat> and one that particularly made me grind my teeth was the Good Law Project challenge to government policies at the end of 2022. Um, for those of you with a, a very strong legal memory, this was the a challenge to the way that the government had been 
making government policy using WhatsApp, where the decisions were automatically deleted, where negotiations were automatically deleted. In that case, there were 34 different pieces of government guidance that they'd said that this should not happen. And the Good Law Project said, look, what the government was doing was against the law, but the, the courts disagreed. They said this is policy to govern the internal administration of government departments. We will not enforce them as if they are law, which I think is quite concerning. If laws are made less strict or they are replaced by policies because they become effectively in many circumstances unenforceable in the same way that law is and there's a couple i've quoted a couple more cases i'll try not to quote too many cases at you today but there are a couple more that are interesting here the mott case is the one that the judges always go back to where again you've got this the judge saying it's not the function of the court to form its own view on the views of different experts. He's concerned only with the rationality of the decision, and that's those public law principles. And a reviewing court will be very slow to conclude that the experienced decision maker reached a perverse scientific conclusion. So they don't they don't interrogate the scientific evidence. They just say, was this a reasonable conclusion given the evidence that was there? Indeed, and this this case here about canoes on the River Wye and the effect of that canoe launching on the River Wye species, the court said there's an enhanced margin of appreciation. So the court, if anything, the court will have greater respect for scientific authority and will be less likely to, to step in and say this was a wrong decision when there is scientific evidence being promoted. And then this one, and I think this is the one of them that I brought up because it was get, went into things in a lot of detail. Unless there's clear evidence revealing a failure of expertise, a conspicuous factual or scientific error, the court will say that there is no failure of justice. And you say, you're seeing here the scientific integrity of the Environment Agency's assessment is not for the court to explore. The court will not substitute its own view for the Environment Agency. Mm -hmm. And again, you've got this, hopefully you're getting it by now, the, the way that the courts say, no, we, we will only step in where we think the judgment made was absolutely irrational or manifest some other distinct legal error, such as not consulting a body that was meant to be consulted, um, really clear legal flaws. And this one I put in because it is so recent, um, just June this year, which was a challenge to the Sizewell C DCO, and you can see here that the court started off by going back to that Mott judgment, which I mentioned earlier, with this enhanced margin of appreciation for scientific, technical and predictive assessments. Um, they're saying, look, we've got all of these predictions about climate change because climate change was raised in that case as well. And that and because we're dealing with scientific evidence on climate change, we're going to apply that enhanced margin of appreciation. And they're all, and they're saying that decision makers do these make these decisions in the context of a range of statutory regimes, which is why climate change isn't the one that they will they won't they won't impose those they won't give the same legal weight to those climate change targets as they might to other uh, more clearly stated goals and requirements in, in the legislation that governs, say, a DCO, which is, I can understand, extremely frustrating if you are really concerned about something like a nuclear generating station and the effect of um, climate change. So that's a really brief canter through the last three or four years of significant cases that looked at environmental impacts where challenges have been brought to the way that the government or another decision maker 
the weight that was given to scientific evidence. And hopefully you can see a really clear pattern where the judges will overturn a judgment that is poorly made. And I think the Secretary of State's decision to approve, or was it to approve or to refuse? It was, it was a decision on the Aquind um, undersea cables. That was poorly made and the judges quashed that decision. But unless they can find a legal defect, they're very unlikely to say, oh, this scientific evidence simply wasn't valid and we are going to quash this decision because of the we, we don't agree with the scientific evidence. And I think when you've got the frust frustration of third parties, there is a tendency to think that technology will be the solution. And that's not the case. Um, and I'm going to start here with a I think the best um, description I've ever seen between the difference between human decisions and statistical decisions or algorithmic decisions. Um, and you've got Lord Sales here talking to the Information Law Conference back in April. He says, humans make decisions by some process of reasoning. Machine learning relies on statistical inferences. It's not identifying a factor as relevant in the way that humans would, but just saying that there's a statistical co correlation. And he's starting to say, he's starting, and I have to say he's a much greater brain than I am. He is starting to engage with what irrationality might mean when we come to consider decisions that are highly influenced either by evidence generated by algorithmic means or predictions made by algorithms and statistical analysis. And he's saying the common law, which is case law, is really going to have to deal with what relevance is because it isn't the same for computers as it is for humans. And I think the same thing can be said about uncertainty. Um, but we ha do have two cases so far with the courts where they've dealt with the mathematics of a decision. You've got one here with Friends of the Earth challenging base on the net zero strategy, where they were based, where they were looking at algorithmic modeling. Um, and they're saying, you can see here, the Secretary of State is assisted by modeling work, but the results of that exercise will be subject to uncertainties. So it doesn't get rid of uncertainties. And they're saying at the end, the Secretary of State state's decision are matters of judgment. So it is still that human judgment informed but not circumscribed by quantitative analysis. So the courts are starting to grapple with the input of algorithmic evidence. And there's another one here on a residential development and it was, it was largely to do with the um, nutrient neutrality, but it also had an algorithmic assessment of housing need. Um, the the planning consultants had used an algorithm based assessment and the council had used good old this is what we've had and this is what we predict we'll need and he said either one will do um and he he finished by saying um reasonable science to think that reasonable scientific judgments can only be reached through other arithmetical calculation is to take too narrow a view um Judgments can be formed and sometimes will best be formed without resort to arithmetic. So where we are with algorithms at the moment is tolerance, I think, and accept accepting that they are part of it. So decisions about development have to assess likely future environmental impacts. Those impacts are always uncertain. Humans tend to just take that uncertainty into account as part of the decision. Where decisions are challenged by the courts, the courts only look at the human decision-making process, not the science. A different kind of decision-making is on the horizon, fundamentally different to the way that we think of things like relevance and uncertainty. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my session on. And this is where I'm taking a step into my particular area of unknown. There's a fantastic paper written by some um, specialists in this area. And really, the rest of my session simply highlights for you what they are saying about statistical uncertainty.
And each of the numbers in the rest of my presentation are references to page numbers in that paper, which is only about 40 pages long. It's not too bad. Um, and what they've done is focus on how there is uncertainty in the algorithmic process. So they've said, you can't determine how, how much value a model adds without knowing something about uncertainty. Uncertainty is inherent in the, in the inputs. Using models doesn't eliminate uncertainty. Weather is the most uncertain thing of all. So it's certainly not the um, certainly not the answer to climate change. And Chris Dent is a reasonably good friend of mine now, and he's literally banged the table saying there is nothing more complicated than nature, and algorithms are not going to fix that. And then there may be uncertainties arising from the model itself. And as they say, a model can just be a gut feeling. A human model about something can be a gut feeling. On the other hand, it can be really complex, making many forecasts into the future. And then they say surrounding the model is a no man's land of factors that can bias it, but may not be included. Some are known, some are not. And none of it is real world. And they say there's a real risk to think that algorithms can sort the issue without realizing that there's a limit to what you can do without getting into real world scenarios. Now, I'm not going to go into any of these in any different in any um, detail because they do a lot more analysis than I do. But this is just a sample. It's page 34, a sample of the kinds of uncertainties that are inherently connected to algorithmic analysis, statistical analysis. More hopefully, I think, they start to say, OK, we've got this uncertainty. How should we deal with it? And they're saying you should assess the uncertainty. You should quantify the uncertainty. You should make some kind of assessment for how important that uncertainty is. And you should really have care for how you make this decision, dealing depending on the problem, the resources and the commitment of the organisation. And I think what they're really clear about is that algorithms alone are not the answer. Um, and they say we are not moving for all of those who think that algorithms are going to take over. We are not moving into a world where algorithms can make different decisions divorced from humans. The jury is out and remain remains out for a long time attempting to pin down a theory of a good guide to uncertainty. And what I found most comforting about this is that all of the options that they suggest for managing uncertainty are the ones that are already in use for managing uncertainty in human decision making. Things like engagement, visualization, testing scenarios, communicating risk and communicating to the general public. And they also say things like, if you're going to monetize something, please do it with uncertainty built in. Please make your analyses as complex as possible, especially when it comes to things that can't be quantified, such as the value a local, a, a local community might place on a bunch of trees or a village green that has nothing to do with its statistical value um, as green space. And in the end, they even suggest really simple visualizations like a red, amber, green representation of options against criteria. And I really am over the moon to see that their conclusion that there's no point in modeling if results can't be effectively explained to decision makers. And as I said, I think for me, the comforting thing about uncertainty and the future is that so much of what they're already identifying is something that we already have baked in as a legal requirement, like engagement, or, or already part of the sort of reports we would already write for development proposals. And it still, it seems to me that 
in spite of all these uncertainties, the best way of, de- of making a decision is still one that is public, supported by reasons and formally recorded, whether that's based on scientific evidence, predictive and analytics or both. And I think the key takeaway today is, apart from don't expect the courts to fix any any, um, conflicts between the scientific evidence, we have got to, as as a profession, not to present statistical modeling as truth no matter how complex or opaque the foundational algorithm. And we need to be clear about uncertainty. And as they said, the uncertainty itself needs to be assessed and presented in a good way with good graphics. So that's the end of my presentation. Now, often at this point, um, I end up with um, absolute silence because these are the these are the um, ideas I've been throwing around in my brain for the last couple of months, but they're fairly new. So I'd be really interested to see if we've got any questions. Thanks so much, Sue. That was a really um, a really interesting presentation. I think a lot of food for thought about uncertainty in both the human process um, and now this kind of new algorithmic process that you mentioned. Um, and as you've said to all the attendees, um, just a reminder, you can put all your questions in the Q and A option. Um, so to kick us off uh, with the Q&A question, um, you mentioned throughout your talk, and, and this was kind of a key theme, was um, um, how uh, the courts look at the decision-making process rather than the scientific evidence behind the decisions. Um, given the rise of some of this kind of statistical analysis and modelling that you mentioned, um, how is it ensured that these models are robust so that these decisions are being made to the best of the kind of knowledge mm. and, and, and to evidence that is robust in that way? I think there's a real, I mean, there's not, we don't have a deficit of ideas here. I think we have too too many ideas and not enough central guidance. So we've got quite a clear division at the moment between the way that, for example, the EU is regulating AI and the way we are regulating AI. And in the gap we have in England at the moment, we have an office for AI that has its one eye set of ideas. We have the um, Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which has a transparency register for algorithms. The Turing has a register and lots of guidance. Um, Ada Lovelace at another key national institution with a great deal of guidance about how to make a good decision using AI. And I don't think, I think they're all good But when I look at the planning system, we have the National Planning Policy Framework and we have the National Planning Policy Guidance. We could really do with that level of central government assurance to say this is the guidance on how to make decisions with AI. They could reference all of the others. And uh, and you could have that kind of, you could have national policy principles, just like we do for planning, that could be supplemented with national planning policy guidance that's much more fluid and, and adaptive to new ideas. But we don't. And the problem is, and my my kind of dystopian view is that we're going to be in the courts in a couple of years with barristers are saying my algorithm's better than your algorithm or my algorithmic assurance process is better than your algorithmic assurance process. That is where we're headed. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you. You kind of touched on, on the other question around regulation there as well and how you think that needs to change. Um, so I'll just read out uh, one of the questions from the attendees. It's a, it's a little bit long, so just bear with me. Um, in the Back EV Environment Agency, mm. how do the courts square the argument about not looking at the scientific evidence with the statement in this case that they will look for clear factual errors? How will they know if they are not reviewing the evidence or are they simply relying on the arguments put forward by each party? Yeah, they would be relying on the arguments put forward by each party. And I think when you have a situation like this, you will find it's I don't think it's likely that scientists would be producing poor scientific evidence. What they do is provide divergent scientific evidence. Now, if there was a factual error, you could rely on that to be brought before the courts. If it was a factual error, 
that was influential on the judgment, the judgment would be quashed. Um, if there was clear guidance on an element of the decision making that was ignored, that might also lead to it being quashed. But what you're not going to do is to, is is have the court saying these are two pieces of valid scientific evidence and we prefer this one and this is the one you should have gone with. That's what won't happen. Mm, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, and I've just got a comment here that I thought you might be interested in as well, which is um, from an attendee that works in in the air quality specialism, and mm. they've said as a discipline that use mod that uses modelling and has done for years, um, uh, they completely agree with your thoughts. It's interesting that when they started their career, they would calculate an uncertainty for each result and state this, but this isn't being done anymore. Perhaps it should be brought back. Yeah, I think there's. I mean, it's not just me saying that, it's a professor in mathematics at the Turing saying that, literally banging the table saying there's nothing more um, uncertain than the natural environment. And he said, England's particularly uncertain because we're an island. Mm. And so all of the data that's used for weather um, modelling, you can't just use data that's produced in America, you've got to use data that's produced here. And then climate change, because it's a black swan, creates black swan events, makes historic data less relevant so we are in a situation where we've got to be clear about uncertainty absolutely yeah um and there's a question uh, kind of related to what you were just talking about um which is a uh, kind of a specific case but where there is no replication possible for something mm. how how can you calculate uncertainty in that case you would say that this is the evidence we have and one of the fa- one of the factors that makes this evidence um more or less something that you can rely on is that we can't replicate it you're transparent about the deficiency mm. um it does that if i hope yeah yeah no that makes what, a lot that's of what sense what you would do yeah thank you um uh, we've got another one here saying it appears in the consenting process that dealing with uncertainty is becoming an increasing area of tension and leading to almost analysis paralysis where decisions <laughs> on major infrastructure are being delayed. We know change within statutory consultees and processes takes time. When do you think we can realistically see a better way using AI or, or not to make decisions where there are high levels of uncertainty? Ooh. Well, we could do with the government actually publishing something rather than issuing consultations. Um, The data strategy has been published, but we only have an AI white paper. Until we have something actually published in terms of central guidance and a government that follows through on what it says it's going to do rather than setting up another body because and I've seen that even in the last month or so, there's now a, a there's a proposal for some sort of AI um, that they've introduced this thing called um, frontier AI, which is very high risk AI. And there's a frontier AI, AI conference in November. And it's as if, you know, we we have CDEI with the with the trans with the register. And then we have Turing, we have Ada, and just as we thought we'd kind of, and the Office for AI, and just as you think you've got all of the relevant factors, a new factor comes out, a new body is created. I don't know when we'll have clarity, but I know that we won't have it while this is the res- the, the way we respond to the challenges of AI by simply having consultations, having draft documents, setting up new bodies. That's not the way to reach any level of certainty. Mm. That's interesting. Um, And we've got another comment here saying that I've seen elected councillors be impressed with consultants' computer modelling to the extent that they can ignore or downplay internal expertise, which may be more relevant or even better. How do we get the interesting presentation here put over to non-experts such as councillors? And I guess this links to a question I had as well around whether there's kind of skills needs among decision makers in in relation Mm. to this kind of information. Um, Yes, I mean, I would say... There, there are some amazing local authority officers who are really grappling with AI. I'm on the ethics board for Brent Council, and that is a council that's way ahead. Um, but the decisions they make at the moment using AI are not really in the area of land proposals. And in that area, it's no surprise, really, that there's 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 a real deficit of 
skills, knowledge, resources. Having said that, there are also a lot of local authorities with a, a amount of skill and resource in this area. I think there's some lobbying to be done with the powerful authorities like the GLA, who are aware of this, They're, I'm on the London Data Board as well, and they are keenly aware of these issues. Um, there is lobbying to be done with organisations like the um, Local Government Association, perhaps the Law Society. Um, but there, I, I, it's really nice to have a comment that says, I agree, because if I think if I'd taken this to a room full of lawyers, they wouldn't have known questions to ask mm. um, unless they were extremely specialist in AI mm. and then they might not be land lawyers. There's not much interface between technology and land issues at the moment. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, and with the increasing rollout of market-based instruments, uh, many which can be predicated on likely beneficial outcomes rather than mm. robustly monitored payment by results, how can AI aid or confound this? Um, I don't think it's about the AI confounding or aiding it. I think it's about, again, interrogating the model, asking what values were imposed. And although I don't want to over-bureaucratize the process, if you are making a complex decision with you know high levels of cost involved and you're using algorithmic evidence, if I were the local authority or the decision maker, I'd be inclined to go to a trusted organization like the Turing or ADA and say, do me an audit of the values of the of the of the wood that were given, of the data that was used, so that we can have a sense from an expert of how valid this model is. Great, thanks. Um and how do you convince KCs? I'm not sure if you know what KC stands for. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. When they when they prepare cases, that modelling is inherently uncertain because, in my experience, KCs want to present modelling outputs as truth, with most, yeah. if not all, uncertainty removed in order not to have a weakened case, which the opposing barrister may then target. Yeah, I would say put that Turing paper in front of them <laughs> because it it is only forty pages. It's incredibly clearly written by people who really know what they're talking about. Um, and if the barrister ignores it, well, you've tried, the, even if it's a KC, you've tried. But, I mean, uh, for me, I would say, oh, this paper came up. I think the other side are going to raise this as an issue. Do you think we should cover it off in the in the, in the the cross-exam? Great, thank you. Um and uh, well, there's no shortage of questions today. We've still got them coming in. <laughs> it's very heartening. Um, um, just a comment here, which is saying that um, uh, this is from an EIA professional, which is saying that in EIA, we should be stating the limitations, assumptions and areas of uncertainty anyway. But the latter tends to not be explicitly stated as we as mm. we've discussed. Um so how would the courts take into account the experts' opinions in the uncertainty in government policies coming to, into effect or not, uh, such as things like sustainable aviation fuel? There is often a high risk involved in projects that rely on such policies. Um, the courts are not going to get a government policy and say, we disagree with this policy. Um, the courts are not going to look at a government law and say, we disagree with this law. They could be, in their spare time, climate change activists, but as judges, this will be outside the scope of their power. They are mm. only going to say, how was this law applied? Did you use the right words? Did you apply the right tests? And when you applied this policy, did you take the, the things that the policy requires you to take into account into account? They are not going to, I mean, they're quite clear. It's almost as if they've been given the same sentence when they when they do these cases. It is not the court's role to challenge the merits of government policy. Unfortunately, that's where we are. <laughs> I'd say unfortunately, well, it's to, to, you know, that is the judge, that's the role. That's why we have a division of functions mm. in government. Yeah, of course. Um and uh, in terms of what you've talked about today, would you say that the same principles apply to assessments that look at current rather than future things, uh, for example, like life cycle assessment or carbon footprinting of products, mm. uh, which are often based on secondary data from similar production? Yes, I think the same principles would apply. If you've got any level of uncertainty, 
they should be written in. And the same thing goes to the, the way the judges will look at it. They're not going to say, oh, I looked at both of these carbon assessments and I agree with this one. They're only going to say, um, it looks to me like you came to this conclusion and I don't see how you came to that mm. conclusion from this evidence. That's, yeah. the, that's the link they're going to interrogate. Amazing. Thank you. Um, uh, another attendee here saying wonderful presentation. So interesting. Um, and that your presentation seems to emphasize the importance of environmental decision support systems or EDSS. Um, we do have a basis for modeling black swan events and other yeah. phenomena, which often do not have antecedents, which mm -hmm. is the Bayesian inference based EDSS. Have you seen this type of methodology used to support legal cases? I haven't. But I'm not an AI specialist. <laughs> I, I'm just a planning lawyer who's really interested yeah. in digital planning. I think that's a. It's that sounds like a really good. Um, I love that technology can come up with tech solutions to its own problems, and perhaps that will become an industry standard. And it sounds like mm -hmm. it's one tool that could be usefully used. But I haven't come across it. Amazing. Thanks. Um, and do you think that we're going to need to define what it means to be an expert in the field of AI yeah. and or planning? Um, and do you think that um, that will lead to kind of legal responsibility shifting to the companies who are creating the, these algorithms? Um, expertise is not is usually defined as you as any of you know who've ever given evidence by the paragraph stating what your qualifications are we are in a world where expertise gained even 10 years ago is out of date mm. um i don't think we'll ever get a legal definition of an expert i mean it's something that has been grappled with in the fire safety legislation as to what what qualifications you have to have in order to be a fire safety expert perhaps that will come through with with algorithms as well um but no i'm not i i don't i think particularly given the speed that things are evolving at having a legal definition of an expert is probably just a waste of everybody's time at the moment mm. <laughs> there oh, are better you. things to be legally defined <laughs> yeah thank you um, and then I know you said, you you know, you're not an expert in AI, but we've just got one question here that I, mm. I'll, I'll just throw out to you anyway, which is, um, can AI provide a score to the relative weight that can be attached to two conflicting sets of scientific evidence put before a judge? It could, but why would it? There's a there's a paper by Turing written in. 1952, I think it's called the it's it's one of the, the, the sort of seminal works. And he says, you know, people ask me, what do you want? Why should we ask the computer what it thinks of Picasso? And he says, well, we could ask a computer what it thinks of Picasso, Picasso but why would we when we have X million humans who can do that? And I would I would say that if we've got if you can make a good human judgment, then don't waste a computer's energy trying to make it use the computers for the computational stuff the stuff that they're really good at amazing thank you um and we're just running out of time now we've got kind of two comments which are quite similar so i'll just go through these and, and then i'll close out um but thank you so much for answering so many questions <laughs> um so the two comments here are wonderful totally agree with everything you've said and great to hear this from a practicing lawyer i wonder if we could go beyond making clear uncertainties and shift to ensuring that those making decisions understand the implications of uncertainties mm. on the decision could this give rise to a sense of evidence-based wiggle room for example yeah yeah, I think that's good. And then the, a similar comment from a, from another attendee saying, I think a big part of the problem is that human beings are inherently poor at understanding uncertainty. <laughs> Even when acknowledging all the uncertainties in the assessment, we are still pushed to make a single definitive conclusion, which is understandable given that there are so many factors, um, but still frustrating. So two similar, yeah. quite similar comments there. And that sounds a lot like something Chris would say as well, Chris <laughs> Dent from, from Edinburgh and the Turing, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Sue. That was a really, um, really kind of thought provoking presentation and obviously lots of interest in this area, as you can see by all the questions. So really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, and thank you to all our attendees as well for coming and getting so involved in the discussion. Um, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. Uh, and don't forget to record your attendance at this webinar on the IES CPD tool if you're an IES member. Um, and you can do this by logging into the members area. 
Um, as I mentioned, this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on the IES website and our YouTube channel as well. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, please do subscribe to our channel, like the video and hit the bell to gain notifications of new content. Our next webinar is actually tomorrow on the 27th of September. Um, and this is a webinar which is part of our Day in the Life series, uh, which is sharing stories to environmental professionals about how work has evolved and how it may change in the future. Um, and this webinar will be presented by Jonathan Atkinson, who's technical director at Clare. Um, and like all our webinars, you can register for this on our website. So again, a massive thank you to you, Sue, and thanks to everyone watching today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much.